I don't get a plan, but I get a promise. Right. And the promise is everything that you face in that calling, he promises to be with you. He'll never yeah. leave you nor forsake you. Well, hey, everyone, welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas you can use today. Take your leadership to the next level. I'm your host, Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University. I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And man, are we excited today to introduce our guests for today's show, Rich Wilkerson, Jr. Rich and his wife, Dawn Cherie, serve as the pastors of VU Church in Miami. And, uh, and you're here for our SCU conference and just a privilege to have you. I am pumped to be here. Thanks for letting me come back. I think I was here... I feel like I might have been here pre-pandemic. I don't know. Yeah, it yeah. feels that been, way yeah. to me just because of all the growth and all the mm-hmm. buildings and all the stuff that I haven't seen before. And so I've been walking through the campus, always blown away, always excited, and always leaving inspired. So thanks for having me. Oh, man, a privilege. Now, uh, Vu is is really, a, 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 and I love what you've done uh, in Miami. It's a catalyst of faith. It's a catalyst of uh, you know, creativity and diversity that celebrates, you know, the unique culture of, of that vibrant city. Tell us briefly about the journey behind VU and, and what, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, after we got done with school, my wife and I, we moved to Miami, served my dad for eight years and every role you can imagine as you do when you go on a yeah. church staff. Mm-hmm. You learn all the different hats, youth pastor, kids pastor, adult pastor, executive pastor. Got a lot of different titles, but I was always just doing work. And uh, after being there for eight years, took a big step of faith to launch the church, Vu Church. Vu is short for Rendezvous. Rendezvous just means the meeting place. Right. That was the Tuesday night Bible study that we had. Nobody can say the word nor spell the word. <laughs> when you Google the word, we don't want to see the websites that come up. So we went with Vu, which actually turned out to be one of those kind of cool little ideas that you didn't mm-hmm. know that God right, was yeah. in it. A unique word, a made up word that took on its own identity and its own life. But uh, we started the church eight years ago. Today, we're in four different locations. Mm-hmm. It's a very diverse church, uh, probably less so about our great leadership and much more just a reflection of what the city actually is. But from North Miami all the way down to South Miami now, we see thousands of people gathering and the church continues to grow and we continue to see people meet Jesus and we're having the time of our lives. I love it. And what's cool about Voo Church is it's really become, I feel like, a, a feature of Miami. I mean, mm. you hear people talk about Miami and it's part of the conversation there. What does that mean? I mean, I, I know it's not necessarily something that was intentional, but something that grew. How did you steward that? How did that grow? How does how did you guys think about that in, yeah. in church that's there? You know, I love that idea. I heard, I don't remember who I heard say it, but the idea is like, if your church was to shut down, would anybody in the city yep. actually even care? I think that's actually a really great thought pattern for any pastor that we're going to gather, we're going to raise up leaders, we're going to preach the gospel. Are we making any form of a difference? And we can start talking about all the different, all the types of differences that a church could make. But I think some of the big things that were important to us quickly was that we wanted to serve the city. Mm. Monthly, we do outreach projects. And the tagline for the outreach projects projects is, we're not here to change a city, we're here to serve a city. Mm -hmm. We're here to love a city. We'll serve it, we'll love it, God will change it. That's based upon that idea that Paul said, I planted seed, Apollos watered it. Only God makes Mm -hmm. it grow. But then I also just think that we, hopefully, I want to believe that we created a church that people felt accepted in, that they could belong Mm -hmm. in, that they weren't judged the moment they walked in. And I don't know if it's just like the event side of Miami. Mm -hmm. Miami loves a good party. Right. Not the most loyal place, let's be honest. (laughs) I did a study at Harvard University. That's a quick brag right there. But um, they did, it was a study with young leaders from different cities, and they gave us this huge, thick packet on our cities. And so I went there with nine different kind of young Mm -hmm. leaders in Miami. Uh, one of the young leaders that was there is Francis Suarez, who then became the mayor of Miami. And we were kind of coming together with different people from yeah. society to look at our cities. And so they kind of did a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, sure. and threats. And the thing that I found out about Miami is that Miami's like double, 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 double zero when it comes to like the idea of community engagement. Wow. I think that's probably something towards like the melting pot of what it is. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I remember when LeBron was there with the heat, yeah. Yeah. you would go and like, yo, it was finals and first quarter, that place wasn't full in the first. Wow. You know, it takes yeah. a while for that thing to swell up. And so I think there's something about the event culture and maybe even Vu with it being a young church. I think we were able to play into some of yeah. that, some of that just culture of like making church attractive and fun. Mm-hmm. And so I think people, like you said, yeah. have kind of made it like, you know, on the Yelp map of the things I have to go to. Right. Somehow Vu Church lands as one of the right. places exactly. in Miami that you should check, check out. out. So yeah, it's it so fun. And so you guys grew four campuses. Tell us a little bit of what's coming next. Have you seen some, we've seen some things on social media. You've got new camp, capital projects. You've yeah. been some expanding. I mean, what's next on the free for you guys? Well, in Dr. Engel knows a little bit about our story, mm-hmm. my dad and... Um, this past year, we actually got some really terrible news about my dad that he has myelofibrosis, which is a bone marrow cancer. Wow. 
Uh, if you know my dad, he's a fighter. He's yeah, energetic absolutely. and um, he's the best. But it sort of has expedited some of the situation that we're in. Currently in South Miami, that's an old Baptist building that we own. There are seven acres and a, a wonderful building that we've grown in, but it desperately needs a new facility. So we had already begun about a year and a half ago, kind of a capital, uh, we, we don't use that language, but that is the language, mm -hmm. a capital campaign of raising money for a $30 million build over there. But then just this fall, dad and his mm -hmm. situation was putting him in a place where his facility was going to probably go onto the market to some degree or pass in a different direction. Wow. And so Vu actually had the opportunity to come in and buy that. And um, I really sense God mm -hmm. in all of it. Totally. It's interesting, the idea that I think people don't realize and I'll use some kind of biblical words, but then let's make it practical for the leader that's listening. It's not in church, but like harvest is heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So growth is hard, you yeah. know, yeah. scaling right. is pressure and a tree that bears fruit hangs over. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you ever see Dr. Engel walking by kind of hanging low, it's not because yeah. he's not happy. <laughs> it's just because there's so much fruit coming out of what they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned that that pressure, yeah. even though it's a privilege, mm -hmm. something's coming out of you. And I wish I could say it's always the fruit of the spirit. I wish it was always love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, but it's not always. And so I think in this season right now, we're learning how to steward that. Yeah. And um, I say that very humbly. Like that. There's all sorts of beautiful growth, but I'm learning as a leader that sometimes if you're not careful, you'll celebrate the growth on the outside of somebody, the mm. external thing, the harvest, and not recognize the pain, the pressure, the challenge that they're facing on the inside. And it's a big deal because what you celebrate is what gets repeated. And uh, a lot of people come up to Dr. Engel and say, I want to do what you do. It's like, all right, but you got to do what I did. Right. And it's right. the did part mm -hmm. that's going to lead to the do part. And I'm just learning in this season right now, like, man, there's some great, beautiful growth places, but it's a lot of this private pain and dealing with the, yeah. the chaos and the drama and the fatigue mm -hmm. and the pressure of, on the inside. How you handle that, I think, is what produces the fruit. And, and speaking of that, I mean, you come from a long family uh, of really legacy of ministry. And of course, you, you're talking about your father who, Rich, had a tremendous impact on my life growing up and um, a significant voice. Uh, how has how, how that shaped, coming from that, how has that uh, legacy shaped your own journey and perspective in the realm of faith and ministry mm -hmm. and how God has shaped you uh, to do what you're doing? I think it's undeniable. I mean, I think it's probably the greatest shaper of my life is my father, um, my heritage. I think as a young man, I think immaturity makes you kind of run from it. Immaturity makes you go, oh, I'm in the shadow and mm -hmm. I can't shine myself. But the older that I've gotten, I've just embraced where I've come from and who I come from. And there's no separating that I am sure. the son of Rich Wilkerson, the son of Robin Wilkerson. There's no separating that my grandfather is Fulton Buntain right. and my mm -hmm. grandmother is L Lorraine Buntain. Mm -hmm. These, these yeah. voices and these people have utterly shaped me. I think I heard a theologian one time say, you know, Jesus lives in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. Yeah. And That's good. just the truth of it is, is that yeah. we cannot deny our families of origin. Of course, mm. I don't think those are the only things that shape us. And maybe someone's listening right now is like, oh, I come from some brokenness and some yeah. mm. dysfunction. I think we have to all deal with our past and confront it. And I don't think we go backwards to rebuke it or go backwards to simply deny it. I think we go backwards to build from it. But for me, I think I, I'm always reminded of that scripture in Hebrews where it's like, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Yeah. And I don't know if this is all the way theologically correct, but I think when I get tired and fatigued, I just ran a marathon, humble brag again, I'm just <laughs> doing it all day long here. But there is a big difference when you're on mile 22 right. yeah. and you're in right. the deep neighborhoods of Coconut yeah, exactly. Grove and there's nobody around versus being in downtown Miami and everybody's cheering. You run better with that crowd around you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so much about leadership with what we all do, there's no one ever around you. But it's that word that reminds me that we're surrounded. I'm not secluded. I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so for me, I can hear David Wilkerson from the Banister of Heaven saying, yeah. keep going. I can hear yeah. Mark Buntain, the great missionary in Calcutta, India, and say, don't give up. I can hear my grandfather just cheering me on. And so legacy for me is everything. And, yeah. you know, they're going to forget my name, but hopefully I can instill that same kind of courage sure. in my boys and my daughter. And I think when you start thinking about generations, yeah. It's all exciting. It's much more than ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's fun about your story, I mean, you've got the story of coming into ministry, accepting it, working with your dad, stepping out, doing your own thing, and now you're picking yes, back brother. up all that. I mean, it's, yeah, and you Jesus. don't pick, I mean, you don't predict what that, that's going to happen in the front. It is a full circle. Yeah. And it is, yes, working for my dad, 
being kicked out by my dad <laughs> <laughs> to only being beckoned back by my dad. By my dad <laughs> yeah. is the one who's right. got me in all of it for sure. I love it. And so, you know, we on campus and we've had a lot of students that come from ministry families. They've stepped back into that calling. They're si- they're in that similar time frame. They're like, okay, I'm embracing it, but I'm at the first step mm-hmm. of, I don't know what my journey is going to be. I have this legacy. What advice would you give to them at that moment as they're thinking through yeah. of what's coming next for them and thinking about that the legacy? The word that you chose to use is an important word. It's this word embrace. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. I think, the best thing you do with a calling is that when you sense that from God, mm-hmm. there's lots of things we can do. Some people run from it. A lot of people deny it. Esau despised it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big thing. You despise right. it, you, you lose it. Yeah. The word embrace, I think, is, is a powerful word because... When I embrace something, I don't have to all the way understand it, know mm-hmm. it all the way, but I'm here for it. I think about Joshua in chapter one, when all of a sudden he's transitioning into leadership. Moses has died and here's Joshua. Sorry for all the CEOs out there. I was like, I come to listen to Kent, not always preach like this, but we're going to preach for a moment. Joshua gets a word from God. And many times when we're kind of in these places, you know, mm-hmm. freshmen at college, just graduating from college. I imagine there's a lot of people that are listening right now that mm-hmm. already just graduated from SEU and still are attached to this yeah. place. It's like, I'm in transition. In transition, what we all think we want and what we all think we need is a plan. Mm, yeah. But God doesn't work that way. No. God doesn't deal in plans. He deals in promises. Mm-hmm. And what he says to Joshua is, I'll never leave you nor forsake yeah. you. Yeah. And the promise is the plan. And so I think the first step to embracing the call is embracing the promise. Mm. And the promise is, I cannot describe to you the next five years. In fact, I'll say it this way. If somebody would have told me what the next 16 years of, as I graduated in 2007 and stepped into ministry... If someone would have laid out the 16 years in front of me, I probably wouldn't have done it. Right. Yeah. Probably if, if, if God gave me every step in the next right. 16 Do years, I'd probably be like, doing, yeah. Rich, you got no idea. <laughs> yeah. I'm what's, out. What's yeah. that scripture where he says to <laughs> right. Paul, he's like, hey, go and let him know. This right. man has to suffer greatly for my name. It's like, right. I don't want to, but, right. but it's all worth it. Yeah. Right. And so I think for me, mm-hmm. I don't want to be like just surface or cliche. I think this is a word for me. I don't get a plan, but I get a promise. Right. And the promise is everything that you face in that calling he promises to be with you. He'll yeah. never leave you nor forsake you. Well, if you, I mean, you think about Abraham, right? God gives him the promise, but doesn't tell him that I'm going to destroy cities. I'm yeah. going to split you and your your family Here apart, we go. and we're going to come back around. And you wonder, I mean, I'm, I'm going to call you up to a mountain where you might have to kill yourself. Like, All if God this. would have said that at the beginning... With no, you, he'd be he like, would, this is the craziest plan I, ever. He'd keep the stars. Right. He I just don't gives care. you this step, you know? Right. And, and really that first step is always, I was just teaching on truth today. If you want to grow... You can't spell grow without G-O. It's always a yeah, go. It's always right. a proactive step. And to Abraham, it's like, go to the land I'll show you. And it's in the unknown mm-hmm. that God makes himself known. And so that's the faith journey. Right. That's, that is the heartbreak. So embracing right. the call is like stepping out in faith. Love yeah. it. So when you reflect on your call and, and, and the awesome responsibility and privilege, how, how do you prioritize your, um, your own personal spiritual um, model of spirituality as you lead a community, how do you structure your time mm. uh, so that, man, you always are ready to mm. uh, to do what God's wanting to do? That's an important word. I think the word ready, um, I like it how Little Caesars says it, you know, you don't want it just hot. Yeah, You want it hot yeah, and ready. ready. <laughs> <laughs> We've yeah. all been to that pizzeria before. They were, they were, they you were know, ready. <laughs> yeah, it was hot, but dog, this is not all the way ready. And I think it's the same thing with our spiritual lives that we want to be both and. Mm. And so for me, it comes down to disciplines. Yeah. And those disciplines, I think they, they change with the different seasons sure. that I'm in. Um, the disciplines that I need now with a six-year-old little boy, a four-year-old little boy, and a two-year-old girl, and 55 staff members and a wife are just different from what I needed 10 years ago. Right. Wow. And um, I was just teaching to some pastors recently, and maybe this will resonate with someone, because we could talk all day about which disciplines for me. There, there's a, I have fitness disciplines that I have to. Sure. I don't work out for... You look so much better than me, but I, I just work out for strictly sanity, like yeah. my mental health. Yeah. Um, reading. I've got to be learning something. like mm-hmm. So that could be scripture, of course, but like just other books. Like I, I, I have to get inspired. I need, mm-hmm. I'm an artist. I'm a creative. Yeah. I have to be in nature. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things. But there's two categories that I would say towards the minister, but probably towards even just the leader who's outside of the ministry. And I would say that you need, you need to form habits around two words, the wonder and the work. Mm. Yeah. And when I lose the wonder... When I lose the awe, I lose the gratitude, I lose the appreciation, and I can start to self-sabotage the work. This thing requires work. This thing requires you to be sharp. I imagine, 
as the pressure grows on your part, it's like, yo, I've got to have a physically fit body. I cannot handle all the stress of what this thing brings with it unless I'm sharp. And so I'm always trying to form habits around those two big words, the wonder and the work. John chapter six, they asked Jesus, what is the work? And Jesus said, the work is to believe mm-hmm. in the one God sent. So there's that idea of believing and trusting in God. And what habits do I have that are helping me form my belief in mm-hmm. Jesus? I saw a post you did, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. It was recently enough. I think you were prepping for the triathlon marathon. You kind of went through a little injury, oh, something. My ha- yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, um, I have a stress fracture in my fourth metatarsal. Oh, right. No. You guys know about metatarsals, oh, yeah. right? Sure. <laughs> Actually, I just learned that word and now I use it every Everywhere conversation I, I can. It's my fourth toe on my right, right side. So, uh, how did you keep that? How did you keep up with the discipline through that derailment. I mean, that I think that's the thing when you think yeah. about disciplines, it's so much, it's so easy to put the box, yeah. take it, get it going. And then kid is up all night because they're throwing up. And so now I can't get up early. You know, that's yep. the thing is the big thing. How do well, you push the truth? That? The matter is, is that in crisis, we are reduced to our habits. There you go. So that, that's the whole point of habit. Habits is an, almost an involuntary pattern that I have formed and shaped. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our habits. Our habits. <laughs> like, yeah, right. like there it is, right? Like, mm-hmm. And so we, we set our habits in the good times yeah. because in the bad times, they will show up on us. But the foot thing is a funny story just yeah. because there's so much in that. Like, it's weird when you have a plan and I was training and this injury happened. In fact, I ran 18 miles on the stress fracture. Wow. And I was like, nah, I think this is just an injury. And like, I went in and I was like, no, it's a stress fracture. Gosh. You need six to eight weeks. Gosh. And I only got five weeks of rest, but I was like, dude, I don't think I'm training for another one of these things. So yeah. if I bust this thing, I'm going to go out there. Yeah. But we prayed about it. We talked to a doctor, yeah. but it was so funny, the times that we live in right now. This is a, another picture yeah. of leadership because I think I heard Tony Blair say when I was a kid, like, when you decide, you divide. Mm. And this is a leadership principle that you are never going to make it on the journey if you're living for popularity, that's not right. what leaders do. Right. Like leaders make decisions and every decision, good and bad, divide people. Wow. And so I put up the stress fracture like yeah. post. Yeah. Yeah. You saw I that think, I think There was like 500 comments saw- and it was split down the middle. Nobody <laughs> was for me. It was either, either run or don't run, but it wasn't just run. It was like, you better run for the glory of God. You, <laughs> right. must you have no choice. Start. You have no choice. And then yeah. if you don't run, you're a fool. Yeah. Right. Why don't you wait on God? You teach us to trust. That's... And now you're so full of vanity. I'm wow. like, oh my God, wow. I'm going to lose my church yeah. over this race. Oh my gosh. That's so it's so funny. Funny. That's a good yeah. line. I like that dividing line. And it's, it's so, true though, I mean, right? right. right. What you decide is divide. Yeah. So right. be ready for it. Like yeah, I, we didn't sign up to be popular. We signed up to, to make a difference. Right. And it's when those moments happen, when you get a stress fracture in your foot that tests is the decision oh, and it says, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing, you know, and not, and this is why I'm doing we it. We went into all this train, I have a friend yeah. who's like one of these like mastermind health coach guys and he has like an altitude, like, he has all this equipment <laughs> right. and he took me, I started doing the bike training and he would put me at like 10,000, is it 10,000 feet something, or whatever? Yeah. You can barely breathe and I'm biking now. He has like red light therapy. I'm like, bro, yeah. we look like we're in Rocky IV. <laughs> and I look like I'm It was like, a great picture. Getting, it was oh, good. I was, was like, like, yeah, okay. I'm okay. about to fight Drago or something. <laughs> it's you know? it too good. It was fun. But it's worth it all, right? It was it worth, it. worth we, it. Hey, all. we finished. Wasn't the time I wanted, but I got done with that <laughs> thing. Got That's it all done. that matters. Yeah. We're going to move into our fire round now and ask a few questions that uh, on some of the things we've discussed and just get your gut answered to have some practical, applicable advice for those that are listening today. Uh, let's just do three quick questions. So, Michael, fire. Away. Got it. So I think this is something a lot of pastors deal with is how do you how do you effectively lead confidently while also keeping that humility? How do you mm. balance that? What is what's the secret there? It's a great question. I think that humility for me always comes from that place of gratitude. Mm. I get to do this. Yeah. People make fun of these things these days, but I think it's really important. I think the language, the frameworks as we're talking about, like I want to have a framework. I get to do this. I don't have to do this. I don't have to be at SU today. I want to be mm. here. I chose to be here keeps me in a place that I'm very, very thankful, which keeps me humble. Yep. But the confidence side for me is I try not to walk into self-confidence. I, I, I want to remind myself that it's the Lord who called me to yeah. it. And it's that scripture, I'm going to mess it up, but I think it's in Romans where it's like, you can hear Paul's clarity. And then he says, and now I'm not ashamed of the gospel. There's mm. a bold confidence, but it comes from his clarity of mission. Yeah. Clarity and confidence are the two words that I would connect. Mm. Any area where I'm insecure it always comes back to a place where I lack clarity. There's a lot of confusion. Yeah, so any yeah, place that you can bring yeah. clarity to what you're doing, I think it's going to produce confidence in what you're doing. Yeah. Love it. What advice would you give? Um, we have a lot of students uh, who are stepping in and, and you know, we talked about stepping out in new leadership opportunities that are completely outside of their comfort mm. zone. 
What advice would you say? Well, the only thing about your calling is that it doesn't exist in your comfort zone. (laughs) Your comfort zone's got everything but your calling. Mm. And so I think those are the two words right there is like, do you want a comfort zone or do you want a calling? And the way that we grow our capacity, there's only one way to grow the capacity. You got to challenge it. What challenges you is what changes you. And I want to be more. Yeah. In 2024, I want to grow <laughs> right. this next year. <laughs> right. And the only way I'm going to do that is by actually Excellent. getting outside yeah. of my comfort zone time and time again. Love it. Love it. I'll wrap us up here. So tell us a little bit about how you guys are approaching creating an environment. And this is, I've been to VU a couple of times and you see this, but it's welcoming for all generations, mm. right? You see the plethora, you see the diversity, not just in, in, in demographic background, but also, also in age and generations. How can pastors create that kind of environment in their own churches? Yeah, I think that thinking is a big deal. And so our thought patterns, and we tend to think in ideas and images, Mm. ideas and images, use those two buckets. So when we're sharing ideas from the platform, it's really important that the idea that's being shared is communicated in a way that it's for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning use the illustration, tell Mm -hmm. the story about, I'm always telling stories about older people in our church. Oh, this is the other day, John was in our church and he's a professional boat racer who's in his late fifties. And I, I was using him. I'm like, man, this guy's been around from day one. People say our church is young, but John's been here from day one and he's an accomplished man. And then the other part is images. And so yeah. people are thinking in images. And so be very, very mindful about what's on the social media wow. feed. Be very yeah. mindful. I'm walking around the campus here. What do you want? Do you want a church of, do you want a, do you want a school of diversity? Well, then don't put all the same looking avatar kid up on the board. Make yeah, sure it's right. white kids. Yeah. Make sure it's heavy set kids. Make mm-hmm. sure there's black kids. Make sure there's girls, guys. Yep. So I think ideas and images are a big deal about what we're communicating because it gets people thinking the right way. Yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, so good. Well, Rich, man, what a privilege to have you on the show today. Thanks for taking time. Uh, I, I love your authenticity. I love that you are so relationally real in everything you do, and, and that's huge and significant. So, thank yeah. you guys for having me. We appreciate you guys. We're cheering you guys on, and mm-hmm. thanks for making all of us better. Thank love you. It. Appreciate that. If you want to stay up to date with Rich, you can follow him on Instagram and Facebook at uh, NX at Rich Wilkerson Jr. That's that'll hit all of them, right? Let's go. Oh, TikTok, man! Come TikTok. on, we're having a party on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great. Honest. Someone's on there for me, though. You can't miss that one. All yep. right, Love hey it. everybody! Thanks for joining us today. Hope you have a great week. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on Framework Leadership. If you're watching on YouTube right now, now would be a great time to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can get more leadership content right into your YouTube feed. You can also check us out on Instagram at Kent underscore Ingle at Dr. Michael Steiner or on Twitter and YouTube at Kent Ingle. And hey, if you love great email newsletters, and I know that I do, you want to check out the Framework Leadership Newsletter. Every single Friday drops in great tips to be a better leader, resources, thoughts right into your inbox. Check it out. You can sign up at kentingle.com. Make sure you hop on to there. Thank you so much for listening to Framework Leadership. Take care, everybody.